know, um, we, we, we will t- today to talk about the future of EU-China uh, relations a bit with the title Back to Business as usual, question mark. As you know, we have been COVID now a couple of years and uh, trade has been halting there or it has been difficult with masks and so forth. There's been a new report which has been published by the European Parliament's research service titled EU-China 2030, uh, a European expert consultation on future relations uh, with China. And uh, this report is, is looking a little bit towards the future. And basically what it says is that the economic competition or the systemic rivalry would increase, uh, that the European Union would like to leverage more in order to get market access in, in China, as well as secure its supply chains. So not a very rosy picture. But then on the other hand, if we look at the trade, the volumes or the foreign direct investments going into China and also from China partly going to Europe, we see a different uh, kind of picture. So um, my question goes to you, um, Luisa. Recently, the big companies like BASF, uh, BMW, Volkswagen have announced a lot of um, a lot of uh, investments to China. Is this report wrong? No, I think uh, China is a very interesting market. It will remain a very interesting market. The fact that you have more investments in China for companies that are already in China means that these companies believe the market will continue to be a very important market in the future. If you are having more investment, it also means that probably you are thinking that it might be more difficult to supply the Chinese market from Europe from somewhere else. And I think that is going to be the biggest challenge for the coming years, is how much you will still be able to serve China from outside China, both for reasons that have to do with China policy, because China is becoming also more uh, resilient uh, and uh, more self-sufficient. And this means as well that China is promoting more investments locally and less imports. And we also have, of course, all the restrictions that are increasing uh, from the US side, or export controls, uh, technology uh, transfers restrictions. And this is something we expect will increase in the future. Maybe Europe will follow suit a bit. And then, of course, we also have our unilateral initiatives, uh, initiatives like uh, the due diligence, for instance, or the forced uh, labor ban or forced product, forced the ban on products uh, made with forced labor. So all these initiatives will make, of course, also imports from China more difficult and more complicated. So it's a p- it's also, it on one end, it means the market, the companies believe in the market. On the other end, they are preparing as well for the possibility that you might be, ha- you might experience more problems in serving China from, from Europe in the future. You already touched about the, the supply chains uh, and, and a couple of the uh, legislative initiatives which, which we are planning here to I- increase our resilience, how you, how you put it. Um, I would go back to that later. I would still uh, stay with the general outlook here and, and, and ask you, um, Julio, I, I realized that you, you wrote an article in, in November 2021 where you wrote, I believe China should choose a path of structural and institutional reforms while recommitting to a business-friendly climate that allows European companies to compete on a level playing field. I'm underlining here the level playing field because this is something which has been said for many, many, many years now. Now, this article was published in November 21. Um, I think the world has changed since February 2022 when uh, the war in Ukraine started. Would you still write a text like this? Well, look, the content of the text is uh, not even mine because if we think at it, uh, commitments have been made by China and I speak about those commitments essentially. Uh, yes, there are also expectations from EU side. There are expectations from our companies. We can find those expectations in the EU CCC papers. We can find them in discussing with our uh, partners uh, from, from European business. So uh, essentially, uh, I would say uh, yes, maybe with, not with those words, but uh, it's possible that me or somebody else writes down those sentences. Uh, in the same time, of course, the world has changed rapidly and we see a lot of... Uh, volatility uh, on the relations. We see certainly that uh, that uh, China continues being a cooperation partner. If we look at the figures, because figures are increasing, mm. uh, so uh, uh, it's China or the US, the first trading partner of the European Union. It depends how you measure it, but on, on, on trading goods, uh, I think uh, China is today, as we speak, on the first place. 
And uh, 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 all those things uh, show us that what is happening on the other side of the balance, what is happening on the side of political relations, of side of values, what uh, the Ukraine war brought to us, those are all elements of volatility, which uh, of course uh, influence economic relations. Uh, so uh, we have to draw some conclusions. Uh, the first conclusion is that China is here to stay. So that's clear that we have to find a, a way of tackling all the, the issues, also the concrete issues uh, uh, signaled or pointed out uh, by, by our economic operators in China. Uh, we discussed so much about the um, balanced uh, relation, or the unbalanced realities of our EU-China relation. We discuss a lot about market access. We discuss a lot about uh, level playing field. We don't have them. Uh, we don't have them, and there is no reciprocity, and there is uh, still much more openness in Europe, I believe, than in the big majority of uh, markets globally. So uh, we have to take some action. We have to see how we can diversify. We have to see how we can, uh, well, we cannot make less volatility, but we can build some insurances for companies, and, uh, and, and uh, we have to do that. And also there is, uh, uh, when discussing about, uh, about diversification, there is uh, uh, the big question, with whom should we diversify? How do we make our choices? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, all those are open questions, which uh, maybe I think uh, point to a direction in which the EU-China relations put us a lot of questions, but the answers are not only in the bilateral EU-China relations, but are uh, also in the global action of the European Union. So it's uh, more complex than just a bilateral uh, relation uh, of the EU or of its member states. I would, I, I would take you up on that because you mentioned that there still is no reciprocity. And, and one of the medic, uh, or one of the medicines what the European Union wanted to do in order to gain access was the comprehensive agreement on investments um, uh, together with, uh, with China. And that was actually signed already, and it was going into force, but then um, the, Euro the European Union sanctions China on human rights issues in Xinjiang, and there's been counter-sanctions, including in the European Parliament, from the Chinese side. So one could say that it's been, it's been buried. So now with the new situation, we talk about de-risking, diversification. Do you think, uh, Luisa, that... For the European companies, the CHI is still relevant. Should we still go back to that time and try to push for the CHI? Well, at the moment, there are no political conditions for that uh, to start with. So uh, until China lifts the sanctions on the members of the European Parliament, that is not really an option. If China lifts these sanctions, then we can discuss and reassess whether the CHI is still uh, worth or not. I mean, the political environment has changed significantly. The perception of what China is doing also. We keep on saying that uh, the agreement itself, it was, mm, it was much more in terms of commitments from China, also binding commitments in terms of market access, but particularly on rules, was much further than China had ever done before. So that's why the agreement had a meaning. It meant that we were still thinking that we could improve the access of European business to China, we were still in a logic that we believed we could improve the legal environment for investments of European companies in China, and we were still uh, in, the accept in the perception that China would try to uh, implement its commitments and actually would try to do the reforms that allowed its economy to open more. But in the meantime, I think also the policies in China have changed. Um, we are not sure. Of course, the Chinese keep saying that they would like uh, to ratify the CHI. But the question we also have is, is the CHI and the CHI commitments still in line with the recent policies of China? This is something I think we need to, we need to understand as well. Because in the, meantime, in the meantime, China is also taking a much more 
state-driven approach in terms of the economy. It's, mm, it's an increased politicization also of the economy. So companies feel that they also are under pressure, political pressure from the government, and have less possibility to act according to the market rules. Do you have any examples you could give on that? Because I find it very interesting what you said, that China has changed since the uh, <coughs> early adoption phase or the signature phase of Kai. What, what has happened since, since then? What do you find specifically uh, difficult for European industries? I think, well, some of the measures are also impacting Chinese companies. You have more and more... You, you had from many time, uh, already some time ago, the presence of party cells within the companies. But of course, now they are becoming more active as well. Mm-hmm. Then you have uh, a number of uh, rules and legislations that give more control uh, to the government, to the central government. And one area, for instance, in the procurement area on um, medical devices, for instance, where you see that uh, at sub-federal level uh, you have less uh, leverage to negotiate. So this means that there is more control from the state. So these are some of the elements. Of course, everything has to do with uh, uh, security, with intelligence, with uh, access to information is becoming much more controlled at central level. So also the, the information sharing uh, is becoming more difficult. Um, so all this means that China wants and the central government wants to have more of a control of the whole economy. And this, of course, impacts also Chinese companies, including including the private companies. And we see that there is more and more of a, a tendency from the government to give more power to state-owned enterprises. Many of them, of course, are not really even sustainable from a business and economic point of view but they are being uh, promoted even for the, for the f- by the government precisely because the government trusts them to implement more uh, clearly their policies. Yeah. That's an interesting uh, fact. I'll, I'll take that up. Uh, and and, and I, I asked you first because uh, Mr. Winkler, of course, was the standing rapporteur, one of the uh, political decision makers behind the CHI. So my next question, of course, uh, hearing what just Louisa said, um, also taking into account uh, the very prominent case of uh, anti-coercion or the coercion of Lithuanian industries and Lithuania as a country, do we even have a political will anymore on the member state level to push this thing through? So, uh, uh, first, uh, first a few uh, introductory ideas. I uh, still am the standing rapporteur of the the EU-China relations. So if wherever the comprehensive agreement of investment will reach the European Parliament, in this mandate, of course, which ends in uh, May next year, uh, I will be the rapporteur of of this. Uh, Secondly, you said that, I I, I remember, I just noted that it was going to enter into force. No, it was going to enter into the ratification process because that's the exact situation when the, the sanctions came. Uh, then we, of course, reacted because uh, this was a very uh, immediate reaction and a very united reaction of the European Parliament, regardless about the people, the persons, or the subcommittee uh, uh, that was uh, sanctioned. We uh, acted in solidarity. We said instantly that no, this is a no-go. Now we have uh, this agreement in the freezer and it uh, can be taken out from there only when the political situation of the sanctions is changing. So for the moment it did not change, so we, uh, we, we cannot uh, even consider any of the next steps. But we know very well which the next steps would be once the political situation is, is solved, if it will be solved. And uh, it's the case, uh, we also read them in various reports, we read them in the papers of the EUCCC, the European Union uh, Chamber of Commerce in China, that there is still a case for an investment agreement. And if we remember what are our problems, basically in a short sentence, on balance, uh, uh, lack of reciprocity, uh, lack of level playing field, all those problems are still there. They, they are still even deepening in the last period. They are not uh, going towards uh, some solutions, but they are going towards uh, uh, more and more problems and deeper problems. So there would be, or there should be a case for the uh, investment agreement. Of course, in the same time, uh, uh, discussing about what is happening uh, 
about the content of, of, of a possible agreement. Uh, do we need something like this? Yes, we need also from the rules point of view. And you spoke, Luisa, about the rules. And I think this is very important because at the end of the day, I think what is a, the European Union? It's a rules-based organization mm -hmm. if we want to simplify. So we can thrive in a rules-based environment. Do we have some rules in our relation with China? Uh, not really. Of course, we have the, the general chapeau of the WTO. Of course, we have a GI's agreement. We have a geographic mm -hmm. indications agreement, but that's a very, very thin sectorial thing. It does not ensure really uh, any of our problems getting closer to be solved. Yeah. So, so that is the case of this, and it's clear that, that uh, uh, our uh, economic and trade relation in this moment as we speak with China is indispensable. So, uh, yes, uh, I don't know if I can be now optimistic or pessimistic. I don't know. To, I, I, I'm not able to, to distinguish even. We have this new ambassador in Brussels, the new mm. Chinese ambassador. But is he delivering messages or it's more that he makes some noises after his arrival and, and uh, taking up the new... So it's very difficult to, to, to understand those things. But what we see is that this di discrepancy between economic and trade realities and political uh, realities is uh, really increasing. And just to finish with this, when we speak about uh, uh, rules, about reforms, about what we need to happen in China, we also always have to speak in terms of enforceability. And that is very tricky. Uh, I was 25 in 1989, so I know something about, I mean, when the Romania changed the regime. So I know something about central planned economy and socialist states. And I can tell you enforceability of the reforms stated on paper by, by, by our Chinese uh, partners. Whenever we will reach that point, that will be also very, very tricky.